So today we're going to be talking about hydrologic hazard analysis and how does this fit into risk analysis. So we've got a couple of things that we're going to have as objectives for this lecture. Uh, the first is how, what is a hydrologic hazard curve? How do we characterize those? And then how do we use those hydrologic hazard curves uh, to estimate risk? So you might be asking yourself, why are hydrologic hazards important? Well, because people's lives are involved and that's why. <laughs> so uh, let's talk a little bit about um, this plot here. It's pretty interesting stuff. So here we have a plot of dam failures that have happened from 1975 to 2001. And overwhelmingly, the percentage of dam failures is due to overtopping. So that's, that's why we focus so much on that oftentimes when we're doing risk assessment, because that's the major cause of dam failures oftentimes. And then secondly, we have seepage and piping as the, not even close, but a little bit lower down there. So um, just wanna, that's, that's why this is so important. Also, there's a list of several um, famous dam failures. That top one on the list, South Fork, Pennsylvania, that's the Johnstown Dam failure. And um, if you, any of you ever have an opportunity to go out and see that national park, it's in um, South Fork, Pennsylvania, um, it's very moving, at, at least I found it to be so. Um, there's, a, there's an eyewitness account of a gentleman who survived that flood, and <laughs> it gave me the chills because he was, he was a young man, I think maybe in 18 or so. His folks were in the second story of their home, and they were yelling at him. He was coming in from the fields, yelling at him to get up on the barn roof. And so he scrambled up on the barn roof, and just as he got up on the roof, the flood wave hit and knocked his house away. His parents were gone. And then he rode the barn roof, through that flood and the barn crashed into several other structures as it was riding the flood wave. And um, the newspaper articles after that flood uh, said things like, please send help, we need coffins of all sizes. I mean, it was, it was, it gives me the chills just to think about it. And they, they didn't have a lot of warning that it was gonna fail. Um, they had some telegrams that were sent, but they didn't have a warning system in place. And so basically it just rushed down the canyon and just took out everybody on its way until it hit another canyon wall. So um, that was 2,000 people that passed away and it was, it was pretty drastic. So that's why this is important. So let's talk a little bit about a couple of case histories here. Um, we've got three examples of why flood hazards are important. On the left-hand side, we've got a levee overtopping and breach on the Mississippi River in Davenport, Iowa. In the center, we've got floodway operation on the Mississippi River during the um, 2011 floods. And then on the right-hand side, we've got overtopping of a dam in Iowa during July 2010. We'll talk more about that one a little bit later. Okay, so here's the math. Why is hydrologic hazards important? You'll notice that the probability of loading which is P sub L there, um, factors in both of these equations um, pretty prominently. So on the left, we have the annualized failure probability. And then on the right, we have our risk equation for USACE, um, which is the annualized life loss. So um, pretty important stuff. And that probability of loading, we get that from our hydrologic hazard curve. Another word that we use sometimes, there are three different terms that are pretty synonymous, hydrologic hazard curve, hydrologic loading curve. Um, I thought of another one last night, <laughs> stage frequency curve. So all of those mean the exact same thing. And what we're, the information that we're getting is the hydrologic loading that we need for our equation. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some hydrologic related potential failure modes. Um, spoiler alert, almost every single PFM has to do with hydrologic loading because if we don't have water, in most cases, we don't have a failure mode. So water is kind of important in, in our um, discussion of risk. So types of PFMs that might have to do with hydrologic loading include things such as overtopping of dams and levees. Um, we might be looking at erosion of the downstream tow of the foundation. And oftentimes we're talking about the dam crest itself. Um, if we have high reservoir levels of river stages, we can also have uh, failures such as internal erosion, instability, and 
there's a there's actually quite a few um, and then spillways and stilling basins so we might be looking at erosion of an unlined spillway we might be looking at cavitation we might be looking at uh, shoot wall or stilling excuse me um, spillway sh sorry spillway shoot wall overtopping Ooh, trying to throw that word in there um, we might also be looking at slab jacking if we have a lined concrete spillway um, we might also be looking at misoperation or malfunction of gates, um, pump stations, and or closures. So I had the opportunity to do a, a forensic inspection of a levee where they had failed to um, close the closure when a flood when floodwaters came up. And so there was, a, I mean, they had the structure in place, but they didn't actually get it closed. So they had a whole bunch of flooding in their town. Um, and so we went in to kind of as the core to look at why that happened and to try to identify how they could do it better in the future and if there was something wrong with the way that they had their closure set up. So that was a pretty interesting inspection. Um, and one of the one of my favorite parts is getting out in the field. So that was fun too. Okay, so some of you, especially the non H and H folks, might be asking yourselves, what is a hydrologic hazard curve? I'm sure you woke up this morning and you were wondering to yourself, what is a hydrologic hazard curve? Well, here is one. So on our y axis, I'm gonna kind of explain to you what you're looking at here in the plot. So on our y-axis, in this graphic, we have stage. And so a lot of times we use that um, synonymously with reservoir water surface elevation. Um, we can also have this type of curve for levees. And in that case, we would be looking at river stage. But for, the, for most of this lecture, I'll probably be talking about um, dams mostly. So um, on the y-axis, we're gonna be thinking about the water surface elevation in the actual reservoir. On the x or yeah, on the x-axis is the annual probability of exceedance, and um, so let's also talk about what's happening on the plot itself. So the blue solid circles, those are the annual maximum series of the observed data that we have seen at the reservoir. So those are the peak stages for each year that this reservoir has been in operation, and then um, you also see some curves that are on this plot. So that blue shaded area is the 90% confidence interval. So that the width of that shows our uncertainty all, all the way along the curve. The wider it is, that means we're more uncertain in that area. The tighter it is, that means we have more confidence in our answer in our curve that's fit to that data um, in that portion of the curve. And then we have a couple of, um, there's a black curve in there, and that is our median curve. And then the green curve is our mean curve or expected curve. And the green one, that's the one that we're gonna use to estimate risk with. So keep that in mind. If ever you're given the choice between median and mean, you always wanna pick mean for risk assessment, always. Okay, um, there's also a black box on here that kind of talks a little bit about what PFMs might, you might be looking at when you're looking at different parts of the curve. So in the inside of the black box, um, it says the typical range for static PFMs. And those are ones in this, for this particular dam that happened below the spillway crest. Um, so we're gonna be able to interpolate in that portion of the curve because we used observed data to develop that portion. So we have pretty high confidence. Notice how tight the uncertainty is in that section of the curve. And then when we get outside of that area, when we're beyond the portion of observed data, then you'll notice that we're starting to look at the hydrologic PFMs. So that's when we're gonna start thinking about overtopping, for instance. So also notice there's no blue dots over on the right-hand side of that plot because we haven't observed floods that big yet in this reservoir. And so we have to use engineering judgment and math and regional data and at-site data, which I'll talk about on future slides, um, to inform the extrapolation of that curve because for dams, we often are interested in the more rare probabilities, like one e to the minus four, one e to the minus five, one e to the minus six, um, unless you're in California, and then we're probably looking around one e to the minus four-ish. So um, those semi-arid climates, they do some interesting things. Okay, so there are actually two pieces to developing a hydrologic hazard curve, and this is the first one. This is a volume frequency curve. So notice on the y-axis here we have um, in this case, we have peak discharge. Um, we can also look at this for critical durations for a basin and talk about that in terms of volume. So maybe we have a three-day critical duration for our basin, um, and that's what would be on the y-axis. 
So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's an interesting terminology thing in, in H and H. So discharge, you might think that means outflow, but it actually just means flow. So it can be inflow or outflow, depending on the context. So in this case, uh, we are talking about inflow to the dam. Very good question. Yep. So in this picture, you'll notice it's a little bit different than the curve that we saw a second ago, because now we're talking about flows. And so the center orange line there, that's our fitted curve our analytical distribution, and the blue lines are the 90% confidence interval still. So this is still the same kind of relationship and those blue lines are representing our uncertainty. And then the black open circles, those are our annual maximum series of inflow data. And you might notice that there's quite a few open black circles as compared to the blue circles we saw in the previous. This isn't the same dam, but if it were, um, we have um, methods of extending our record length so that we can actually get more data, and I'll talk about that more on some future slides. And then another thing to point out is there are some flow intervals or a range of flows that are described with whiskers up on the upper part of the curve, and those represent um, some historic floods that we might have some uncertainty about how big they were, but we kind of have a sense for what the range of flows were, and so we're actually able to incorporate that information and the uncertainty in those flows in our analysis. Um, okay, looks like there's some, some things there. Okay, so this next one, this is a hydrologic hazard curve for Lake Okeechobee in Florida. And there are several things that I wanna point out about this. So again, now we're talking about stage. So this is, so just a reminder, we develop our flow frequency curve, which we saw on the previous slide, and that is used to develop our stage frequency curve. So those are the two portions that develop, that are needed to develop the hazard curve. So here we have our hazard curve again, and we have stage on the y-axis. And you'll notice there's often kind of um, a shape that comes up, flattens out a little bit, starts to come up again. Sometimes it'll flatten out again, um, have a, a slightly different slope, and so this, that kind of shape, those inflection points are for a reason. And so it's really important when you're examining this type of curve to know what all those inflection points mean because they're all based on some physical aspect of the reservoir. So they have, might have to do with the storage at a certain level of elevation. They might have to do with the discharge um, or the capacity for discharge from different um, aspects, like for instance, if you have a gated spillway from the gates, or if you have some low flow um, sluice gates or something that are able to release, release water, those are things you want to know. And then as you get higher in um, on the curve, you'll start to see bending over when you hit the spillway crest, and you'll start to see bending over. Um, you should notice some bending over if your um, hazard curve is extrapolated beyond the top of dam. Why do you think that is? Why would it start to bend over when it goes over the top of the dam? There's more capacity, that's right, because we have weir flow at that point, right? Your whole dam becomes your weir, and so you're getting a whole lot of more um, discharge when it starts overtopping. So look for those inflection points and, tr and make sure you understand why they're happening. It's really good questions to ask your H&H &H engineer. Why is that bending over right there? Does that make sense? Um, so. And, and this is all based on conservation of mass. So inflow minus outflow equals change in storage. So that basic equation that you learned back in your civil engineering degree. Um, I think that covers most of the things. Um, we already talked about how those, um, the dots that are there are the observed stages. And we always want to, one thing also to look for is you always wanna have a pretty good agreement in the observed section. Um, with your actual hazard curve. And the reason is because if our model is able to well represent what we've already seen at the reservoir, then we have more confidence that it can well represent the extrapolated portion of the curve. So that's that's just a, a you know a hint of something to look for. Okay. So in um, developing our hydrologic hazard curves, we often use stochastic modeling. And so this is something that our modern um, computers give us a lot of computing power and allow us to do this very quickly. Um, at the Army Corps, we have a program called RMC RFA, and um, you can develop this um, expected curves, those mean curves in like 
three to seven seconds. Um, and then for the full uncertainty, when you want to develop the the 90% confidence interval, um, sometimes it might take you up to 20 minutes or something, but it's <laughs> relatively quick when it used to take like sometimes weeks to compute this type of stochastic analysis. And so, so let's talk about what that means. What is stochastic analysis? So we're using what's called a Monte Carlo simulation. So what it's doing is it's sampling hundreds of thousands of of different options of your inputs, and it's developed. That's how it's developing uncertainty for your curves. So the the chart there kind of lists the steps. So the first thing, remember, I said there were two parts to developing a hazard curve, and the first part is that flow frequency curve. So that's the very first thing we start with is our flow frequency curve, and it's going to sample a discharge or a volume of 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 water, and then it's going to route that through. Um, so it's going to select a starting stage, it's going to select a hydrograph shape, and it's going to have a reservoir model and use all that information to route through, and then we're going to come up with a peak stage in the reservoir itself. And it's going to do that thousands of times, and it, so then it's going to develop one single stage frequency curve, and then it's going to do that thousands of times for all those inputs, and it's going to develop many thousands of stage frequency curves, and from those set of stage frequency curves, it's going to compute the 5 and the 95% confidence intervals and the mean and the median. And so that's where those curves are coming from, is thousands and thousands of iterations of this routing process varying the inputs. So. Um, Sorry, I get really excited about it. It's kind of it's kind of cool. Okay, uh, nerd alert. I know. Okay, so let's talk about hydrologic. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. No anchoring. This is a good question. What um, the creator of this slide deck meant, I believe, is that when we have um, a PMF, sometimes. Um, in risk analysis, it's easy to sort of anchor to that elevation and think everything has to do with the PMF elevation. When in a risk-informed type of format, we really want to focus on what do we actually think is going to be the failure mode for our dam and what elevation would that happen at? So rather than just focusing on one single elevation, perhaps, for instance, you might think that you have an embankment dam and it's probably going to fail um, after, you know, with overtopping somewhere between one and three feet of overtopping. So that might be the range of, that you're interested in looking at. Um, and it sounds like maybe you have something to add to that. Yeah. Stick with just one elevation in mind, and that's that's the low overall. No, we're still doing the PMS. Can you, can you repeat that question for the room, please? It underneath the Army Corps. Um, sorry, go ahead. I forgot how you worded it. So he, the question is, is the Army Corps moving away from using the PMF in the risk framework? And the answer is we're still using the PMF for now. Um, there has been discussion about whether or not we would continue using it. Part of the reason I think, in my opinion, this is my opinion, not the Army Corps' opinion, but I think the reason that we keep it around is because we use it for design. So once we've gotten through the risk process and we're determining, we're using the risk-informed framework to determine what our design al alternatives will be, um, we often use the PMF as our design and then the upper PMF as our, um, what am I trying to say, resiliency um, measures. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, yeah. Uh, extrapolate model from your observed data. <laughs> Right, so, so you'll notice that the green line starts all the way at the beginning and goes all the way through the extrapolated portion. So that green line is our mean curve, our expected curve, and it's developed from that set of thousands of iterations that we've computed. Okay, but your observed data only ends. Right, and so the portion that's beyond that is extrapolated. Yep. So and that's, I think, where Carolyn was saying, fitting that mean to the observed points helps you have some trust in the extrapolated value because your model is matching your 
observed values. Yeah. So then when you're extrapolating beyond the observed, that mean curve is what you're focusing on. Yeah, thank you. All righty, so we have a number of um, guidance documents that exist that help um, in guiding how to develop hydrologic hazard estimation. And shown here are four different examples. Um, there's a reclamation document, there's a USACE document, a FERC document, and another USACE document. Um, also, the um, Nuclear Regulatory Commission and um, TVA and other agencies have these types of documents as well. Um, the one on the very right hand side that is from 2018, um, that's a document that you can find on the RMC website underneath publications. And um, that, get, that I use that a lot to advise folks on how to perform this type of analysis. Okay, so here's another um, guiding principles document. So this is a 1999 report by the USBR and also Utah State. And um, so these are some really good things to keep in mind when developing hydrologic hazard. So it's important to understand that no single approach is going to cover the entire range. This kind of goes back to your question over here about the extrapolated portion of the curve. So we have to combine multiple methods of developing um, credible um, hydrologic hazard curves and the uncertainty. Um, so we're gonna use things like flow frequency curves and rainfall runoff curves to help inform the development. Um, we get the most gain in our development of these curves by having lots and lots of data, as much as we can get. And so we're gonna use things like regional precipitation, stream flow, and paleo flood data um, to help develop those curves as well. And we want to uh, explicitly quantify our uncertainty. So we take that into account in the calculations, especially during the Monte Carlo calculations, um, and that allows us to have some good confidence on what our uncertainty is. And so another, another important thing to keep in mind is that we want to use temporal information, which is a fancy way of saying time. So we want to, I, I mentioned, I alluded to this before, if we have a certain amount of gauge data at our location and there's a nearby gauge that extends back 25 years, then we have ways of using and incorporating that additional data to extend our record in time. So that's what that's referring to spatial information. So that's um, referring to using regional information, like perhaps a regional skew study um, or a regional paleo flood study or something of that nature to inform our analysis. And then we have causal information. So when we understand what actually produces the floods, um, that gives us some information that we can use in our analyses as well. So for instance, um, in some areas of the United States, snow is uh, a big deal. Um, rain on snow is a, is a flood mechanism up, especially in the north part of the United States. Um, and when we understand those mechanisms, that can help us understand how it's appropriate to, to develop these curves as well. Um, and so the, here's another mention of the PMF. So just in general, we don't want to assume uh, an AEP for the PMF, but we can assign an AEP to the stage, the peak stage that a PMF um, causes in our modeling. Um, so, and I'll show you that I think on a future slide. Okay. When we are developing these types of curves, it requires expertise from several fields. Um, so we've got meteorology, hydrology, statistics, and paleo flood. Um, so all of those disciplines are necessary to have the information that we need. Okay, so here are three examples again of some different storm processes. So on the right hand side, um, so I'm going to go from right to left. So on the right hand side, we have um, a storm tracker from Hurricane Floyd in 1999 on the East Coast, and you can see those um, precipitation depths are, are by color. It's probably a little small um, up there, so you might not be able to read it, but the red is like, gosh, I think it's over 30 inches of precipitation estimated in those red areas. So that's some really intense rainfall during that hurricane. In the center picture, um, 
this is Stony Brook Creek in Connecticut. And what's what you can kind of see in this picture, there's several things um, in the kind of on the right hand side, you see an 1850s uh, farmhouse that's starting to get flooded. The floodwaters are, are rising on that farmhouse. And if you look kind of in the background, you might be able to see a roof that um, the floodwaters have already um, risen up above whatever structure that was and all that's showing is the roof. So um, that's that's an example of a uh, type of storm. And the very left hand side, this one's pretty interesting. So this is an example of a flash flood um, on Lions Creek in western Colorado. And what I want you to notice in this picture is there is a boulder bar. So what happened is as that rising limb was happening in the flood, uh, there was a lot of momentum and it was able to carry along these large boulders within the flow. And as that flash flood receded, it could no longer sustain those boulders. And so they dropped out of the flow and then they formed this bar of boulders. And that's evidence that we see after a flood that indicates what, what kind of storm happened there in that basin. And understanding what kind of storm happens can really um, impact I'm not going to get too far in the weeds, don't worry. I could, but I'm not going to. Um, but, but anyway, it's important to understand the storm types. Okay. So credible extrapolation. So in that portion of the curve, when we are extrapolating, how do we know if we're doing a good job? Because we do have quite a bit uncertainty of uncertainty in that portion. So here's some different ways to look at it. I won't, you can read this on your own. Um, but on the left-hand picture, there is a graphic, <coughs> excuse me, um, that talks about rare floods, which are like up to 100 years, very rare floods up to, let's see, I think this estimates it at about 1 e to the minus 4, and then extremely rare floods over um, less frequent than that. And it talks about um, different kinds of procedures, and it talks about the number, the size of the uncertainty that we have at different portions of that curve, which I already talked about. So on the left-hand side, for the rare floods, we have moderate uncertainty. And we have moderate certainty because we've observed floods in that range. So we have, you know, we have a good comfort there usually. When we move into that middle zone, we have pretty large uncertainty. And when we get out to the edges, we have very large uncertainty. So that's why our confidence interval is so wide at that portion of the curve. And then um, this, this other chart, I'll let you peruse that on your, on your own, but it's pretty interesting. It kind of talks about when you add different types of hydrologic information to your analysis, how much more credible your analysis is and how far out you can credibly extrapolate. So it's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Okay. So data sources, um, there are a number of key data sources that are used to estimate hydrologic hazards. So we're talking about things like rainfall, um, flood information, snow information, and even climate information. Um, the USGS is a wonderful source for information for gauge data. Um, we also use databases like SNODAS and SNOTEL for snow information. The National Weather Service has a lot of depth um, information for precipitation, so we can get gridded information from them um, for our hydrologic models. So, and there's even climate information, so we're able to include that in our analyses as well. So there's all kinds of good stuff, um, dew point analyses and that, th those sorts of things. Okay. The Army Corps has a database called the Extreme Storms Database, and they have over 1,100 events in this in this database. Um, currently, it is um, uh, only available to USACE, but as I understand it, this year it will be available to the public as well. So um, this has a lot of really good storm data that can be used. Um, okay, so let's look at this picture real quick. I am running short on time, so I'm going to try to speed up. Um, in this picture are two different gauging stations for USGS. In this right-hand picture, there is a gentleman or a lady in this cage that's going across a cable during a flood event to measure, um, take measurements of the flood depths because you'll notice that the gauging station is looking a little crooked there in the front. So probably isn't capturing good flood data for us anymore <laughs> at that point. Um, and then the left-hand side is another type of gauging station um, that USGS sets up so that we can actually have measurements during large floods. Um, we'll talk about paleo data a little bit. Um, so this is a picture, a cross-section of a creek, and we have evidence, different 
types of evidence of, or physical evidence of a flood, a very large flood that's happened in the past. And when we say paleo, I just want to highlight that we're not talking about paleolithic. We're actually just meaning before the historical record. So we might, our earliest flood in our, in our basin might be like 18 something. And so paleo just means it happened before that. Um, and so I won't get into too much detail, but there are ways that we can tell um, that there has been a historic flood, a large historic flood in the basin. Um, you can see that there's that boulder bar for an example of types of things that you might um, see. And then we also can find evidence that there has not been a flood higher than a certain elevation. So when we have um, stable terraces with well-developed soil, and we can really, we can date that information and characterize it and identify that we have not seen a flood that's disturbed this elevation. And so therefore we haven't had a flood that large, anything that was larger than that. And so those two types of information, evidence of a flood and evidence of there's no flood bigger than this, um, those two can really help us in our analysis as well. So I'm not gonna read these charts to you. Um, you can read them on your own, but they basically list a bunch of different methods for, um, using stream flow in hydrology, sorry. And um, one of them, there are two in there I wanna highlight, RMC Best Fit, which is a Bayesian software that performs flow frequency analysis that the RMC has available. It's on the RMC website on the software page. And then also RMC RFA, which is a software that can develop um, hydrologic hazard curves. Um, that's, those are some really nice pieces of software. And um, I offer, some training in that, and you can also watch those videos on, on the RMC website. Okay, um, I have a few more slides. Is it okay if I keep going? Okay, so here is a picture of the volume frequency curve again. So this is the part one of developing your hazard curve, and there, there's two pictures here. So I wanna describe to you what they are. On the left-hand side, there's a chronology plot so it's basically a time series of all of the data that we have collected, the hydrologic data that we've collected for this basin. Um, so in that, you can see some open circles. Those represent gauge data or systematic data that was rec uh, recorded in a systematic manner. You can see some evidence of historic floods. Those are flow intervals. Um, and we have some uncertainty about the magnitude of those floods, and so we're able to include that in our analysis. And then you can also see some perception thresholds, and those are the kind of boxy areas that represent times where we don't have any recorded evidence of floods, but we have a sense for how large those floods may have been. And so we, we do have a little bit of information, and so we're able to incorporate that in our analysis. And then the result is the volume frequency curve that you see on the right-hand side. And again, the blue lines are the 90% confidence interval. The orange line is the computed curve, the fitted distribution to that um, observed data. Okay, and here's some rainfall runoff methods. And um, just as a quick description of what I mean when I say that, it's when we drop precipitation on a hydrologic model and we route it through the model and we account for losses um, that we, the soil might soak up some of that water so it's not all gonna run off. And then, um, then we get a uh, peak inflow at our dam and we also can record what the peak stage was. So um, whew, there's so much material and so little time. Okay, so I'm not gonna go over this slide because I just told you what that meant. So this is super critical, um, not in a nuclear sense, but you know, this is really crucial. So if you, have, if you happen to be um, aware of somebody doing a hydrologic model, it is, absolutely crucial that it is a calibrated validated model if you're using i mean garbage in garbage out models are going to give us garbage if we give it garbage so you have to make sure that the model actually is performing like you think it is in order to use it and have confidence in it so in this picture we have an example of a calibration and what i want you to notice is that the observed is the blue hydrograph and the orange or red is the modeled hydrograph and in general their shape is pretty close the timing is right on, the peak is happening at the same time, and um, the peak is actually pretty close. Um, it's not spot on, but it's pretty close to what the observed peak was. So that would give us some better confidence that our model is performing how we want it to perform. Okay, uncertainty, so we wanna do sensitivities. Um, this left-hand picture represents some climate sensitivities that someone did for different types of, um, I think it says hot, wet, hot, dry, warm, dry, and warm, wet. Um, so there's some different um, 
examples of some sensitivity you can do for climate. And then um, there's another volume frequency curve there. Okay, and these slides are basically um, on the left hand side is information on flow. And we would use that in RMC best fit to develop our flow frequency curve. Then we would put that flow frequency curve into RMC RFA and develop a stage frequency curve. And then we would use the stage frequency curve in our risk analysis. And this slide is the same kind of information, but it's showing how we would use the precipitation frequency information like NOAA Atlas 14 in a similar manner. Okay, so oops. So real quick, let's talk about the scalability. So it's important to understand that this type of analysis can be used for any type of risk assessment that you are performing, whether it is a period in the use case terminology, we would say a periodic assessment. And I believe in uh, Bureau of Reclamation, they would say comprehensive review. So that's a screening level type of risk assessment. Um, issue evaluation studies is the higher level um, study that in, in, in use case. And then the last part is for dam safety modification studies. So those are the, the point is, is that we can do this type of analysis for whatever our needs are for the risk assessment. And so I just have two slides left. So this one is um, how we actually use the hazard information in our risk analysis. On the left hand side, we have um, a stage frequency curve and with uncertainty. And then we use the loading of various stages in there along with our SRP. In this case, it's called the probability of response given the load. And so on the y-axis, you have stage again, and on the x-axis, you have probability of failure. And you multiply those times the consequences to get your risk. And then I won't talk a lot about this because Damon talked about this yesterday, but you wanna partition your flood event tree using your, your loading curve. And so you're interested in different stages on your loading curve and then the corresponding probabilities. And that is all. So sorry I took so long. <laughs> Great information, Carolyn. Any questions? That was a lot of information. Yes. So on slide 10, excuse me, um, you've got the, uh, the hazard curve and you have empirical measured points mm -hmm. at the high end of, of your measured data that are outside of your sort of extrapolated portion. I was wondering if you could talk about why we wouldn't expect that extrapolated portion to sort of curve further upward to match the empirical data. Sure. Uh, sometimes we have um, high outliers. And so um, our current methodology suggests that we would not, we might think based on our records, it might be the longest, the largest flood in say a hundred years. But based on other evidence, we might think that it's actually the longest in say like a thousand years. But because we don't have that evidence on hand, then we don't, our methodology says that we're not gonna shift that to the right. And so we might believe that it really does actually plot to the right, and then it would line up with our fitted curve. Um, but but we don't um, change it unless we have actual information to change it. That's a good question. Yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. So it seems like the influence is those, the, mm -hmm. that inflection point. Uh, the inflection point is actually, so it's hard to see, but there's a dotted line there. That's the spillway crest. And the inflection point is actually that now flow is going over the spillway crest. And so the, the curve is bending over there. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I just think the looking at the paleo floods is, is really interesting. Yeah. And, and how do you, um, you know, because that could be from a time period, you know, maybe where, where there were no dams, you know, before right. on, on the river, you know, upstream or wherever. How do you, and, and maybe you're looking at floods of a magnitude where the, uh, the, those dams don't even really have much consequence. Mm -hmm. But, cause you're, yeah, I mean, you're looking at a period you know, where there's maybe been a lot of change. Right. Um, I'm just curious how you kind of in incorporate you account? that account for that. Yeah. Sure. So, um, you know, a lot of times we don't have information about what the channel looked like back then. And sometimes the best information we have is the um, as built information from the dam. Um, you know, maybe the original um, survey that they had might be the best information we have and so a lot of times we use that as our starting point um, but we we can know information about the geology of the area and how erodible some of the foundation features might be and so we can kind of estimate 
how much erosion we might expect to have been in that location. And we do incorporate that into the analysis. So um, we use hydraulic modeling and it's, it's pretty sophisticated now. So we can actually change the terrain model um, based on assumptions that we might have. And then we can also make different assumptions about roughness in the channel. And that affects how high the water gets. And so what we're doing there is we're kind of combining our hydraulics, hydrology, and geology all together. And so we collect information at different elevations within, the, within that channel. And then uh, we do some age dating and, we do, and the geologists do some characterization of what those materials are. And then when we do our hydraulic modeling, we try to estimate what range of flows could we actually hit those terraces with. And so we use that information to put a range of dates on those paleo floods. How old do we think it could be based on the age dating, radiocarbon dating, or OSL dating that we do? Um, and then also how big of the flow could, have, could it have been and what's our best estimate for, for flow? And so we incorporate the uncertainty into our analysis. The age dating um, is there um, in the paleo report, but in terms of when we actually apply it to our analysis, we use our best estimate values for the paleo floods. It's probably more information than you were looking for. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.